So there was this pastor, uh, took a pencil and paper, and he sat down and he started writing a sermon out. And as he was writing, his little son was on the floor playing next to him. The son stood up, looked at his dad, and said, what are you doing? He says, uh, well, I'm writing the sermon for tomorrow. The little boy watched for a while, and he says, how do you know what to write? He said, oh, I just listen to God, and God tells me what to write. He watches a little while longer, and he says, Dad, God's telling you what to write? Yes. Then why do you use the eraser so much? <laughs> Sometimes we want the voice of God, but isn't it hard to discern what it is sometimes? Isn't it hard to hear sometimes? The, uh, uh, Tom Long is, the, is a professor at Emory University, Candler School of Theology. And he said one, they, they had a, a dinner engagement one evening, a small group of people, but the main guest was a minister from one of the former churches in the former Eastern Europe countries. And the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc had just fallen down uh, just months earlier. Berlin Wall was down. And so he was in America visiting, and this group of people had all kinds of questions to ask. What was it like to be a church under oppression, under communist rule? One of the things he said was, that really was one of our strongest gifts. For when we were under oppression, we had to really concentrate on the call from God and follow that call. But now that we're free, our newfound freedom, we're afraid that we're going to be wedded to the new culture of freedom instead of the call of God. Well, he goes on to say, when they asked a question about the oppression, he said, yes, we knew that the government had agents with us all the time. Whenever we had a meeting, there was a government agent there. Now, they didn't announce that they were government agents. They didn't say, we're spies in your midst. But we knew they were sheep's clothing, and we knew exactly who they were. Well, the other group asked, how did you know? He said, oh, it was easy. We could tell by their voice. They could say the right things, but something about the texture of the voice always gave them away. Now, you all have experienced that. We've got loved ones that we really love, and they say everything's going fine, but you can tell by their voice, no, something's not quite right. You've got friends that you're talking to. How you doing? And they can say everything's going well, but you can tell by the voice if something's going on. There's something about the voice that you don't get on Facebook and email and, and texting, but there's something about the voice. Do you hear the voice of Jesus? The scripture says that we can recognize the voice of Jesus and follow him, but how do we know that voice? How do we know it's not the devil? Or how do we know it's not the family and friends or our traditions or things from the past? How do we know it's the voice of God? Well, the scripture points to that, but before we get into the scripture, let's look at the scripture in context with the whole Bible. Throughout the scripture, you have the image of the shepherd and the sheep. And the big one is the 23rd Psalm, which we just talked about in the children's message. With the 23rd Psalm, uh, the bottom line of what David is saying there is that God is always with me, everywhere. Whether it's through the good times, times I'm under stress, times that God provides, walking through the valley of shadow of death, God is with me. Now, do you all agree that God is with us at all times? God is with us at all times. But even though God's with us at all times, there's another theme that comes from the sheep and the shepherd in the scripture. And that theme is summed up so well in Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. That's just a very extreme way of saying, even though we are with Jesus and Jesus is with us, there's a tendency for us to be like sheep and drift away and become lost. And Jesus could be in our presence, but we don't feel it. Like right now, I suspect there's some of us in this room that Jesus is with right now, and yet we feel lost. We can't hear his voice. You know what that's like, don't you? I'm sure, I know I've experienced that many times. To be, and you know that Jesus is there, but you can't hear the voice, and you're lost. But the other thing that comes to that is summarized very well in Luke 15. And that is, 
When Jesus tells a parable that the shepherd has a hundred sheep, counts them, one's missing. He goes, finds it. And that is one major word of hope for you and me. That if we're lost, we still count. And he's going to come find us. Now, that brings us to today's scripture about listening to the voice of Jesus. Verse 1. Verse 1 says, again, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, what does that mean? Um, I discovered a lot of people don't understand that. Um, when the shepherd would have the sheep grazing in the field, they would be out in the field in the daytime. And they could watch, protect the animals. They could see other animals coming as threats or someone trying to steal the sheep. But at nighttime, the darkness can't see that. So what the shepherd did, they would bring the sheep and put it in a structure called the sheep fold. Now the sheep fold was nothing but a big wall made of stone that was extremely high that animals could not jump over. But also so high that even though thieves may want to climb in, it would be very difficult for them to steal a sheep and get them out. And these sheep folds would be uh, either in circles or squares, oblongs, rectangles, whatever. But the key part about it, other than the high wall, was there was only one entrance, one exit. Most of them did not have wooden gates. And what happened was the shepherd would be the gate. Jesus says, I am the gate. And the purpose of the sheepfold then is to bring them in and to protect them at night. That's why he said, and they would be safe. That also means they would sleep at the entrance so no sheep could get out and wander away, but also no animal could come in without confronting the shepherd. It kind of reminds me of when I was doing youth ministry a lot. We'd be at a camp. And I had to sleep at the entrance to the hallway to keep the boys safe from the girls. And the women counselors had to sleep at the entrance of the girls section to keep the girls safe from the boys. Jesus is saying, I am the gate. And the word I am is not just I am this, it's I am is the word God. God's the gate. God is the gate. Now, the second thing to notice comes at the second part of verse 3 where he says, He calls his own sheep by name and, leads, name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Now, let's understand something that's just not obvious about this. These sheep folds didn't just include my flock. If you had a flock of sheep, it was a community sheepfold. You would put your sheep in there too. Ten, maybe fifteen shepherds would put their sheep in there. And all these sheep would intermingle. So how do you separate the sheep? Your sheep from my sheep. There was no problem. The sheep knew the voice of their shepherd. And so I would call my sheep, my sheep would follow me, your sheep would call, you would call your sheep and they would follow you. I got to see this in life. On the farm that we grew up, uh, we had some sheep for a short period of time. I don't remember that much about the sheep, but I remember all the cows that we used to have. We have gobs of cows. And I know that my grandfather, my dad, and then my brothers and I, as we grew older, we could call the cows 400 yards away, and they would come to us. Uh, we had a lot of hired hands on the farm. A lot of the times, the hired hands would want to call the cows, and they'd try. Those cows would be chewing the cud. They hear the voice of the other hired hands. They turn and look at them. And they continue eating. They did not respond to the voice of the hired hands. Do you hear the voice of Jesus? That's the voice we need to respond to. He knows our voice. We know his. The next thing he says here, and it's really powerful, is that verse 10, that famous verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Now, a lot of us have these voices or these commercials. Buy these products and they will enhance your life. 
They will enhance your figure. They will enhance your, your, your health. Well, they may, but they won't give life. Buy these things, do these things, and you'll have fulfillment. Mm, for a part of time, but they don't give life. You know those commercials, and you know how we want to follow, and we go after those things, and they, we end up empty? You see, the thief comes to steal our money, kill and destroy, and a lot of these things that are offered us Oh, this is not going to hurt one time. This is not going to hurt. And yet, it only takes one time. It only takes one time to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus comes and we have life. And because he has life, that's the voice we need to listen to. And then the last thing comes in verse 11, which we did not read, 11 through 15, where it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lay down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. My own know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. The tornado went through Joplin, Missouri last week. It was horrible. You all remember reading, seeing reports about that. It was horrible. One of the stories that came out of it, you may have seen on NBC. Uh, Bethany Hansall was being interviewed. And with the emotion she talks about, I mean, really intense emotion. It was, it was less than a minute long, but with really intense emotion. She talked about how her husband, Dan, the moment, moment the tornado hit the house, jumped on top of her to protect her, took the entire blow of the tornado impact. And when it was over, she looked, and he was dead. And she talks about with pain. Now, she loved him beforehand, but you could just tell how she was even more appreciative because he laid down his life for her. And when I saw that, I thought, you know, I am not going to discount that whatsoever. That is, that's powerful. But Jesus did the same thing. And we talk about it so much that we tend to lose its power. But Jesus laid down his life for us. He wants to give us life. Well then, what do we do with this? How do we hear the voice? Let's get very specifically. Four things. First thing. To know the voice of Jesus, you've got to be familiar with it. To be familiar with the voice of Jesus, you've got to be with Jesus. I don't know about you, but if you had those times that people call you on the phone, someone from whenever, and you've only known them a short period of time, they say, you know who this is? You don't know him. Now, my father has been dead 16 years, but I can still hear his voice. My grandparents, my uncle have been, and cousins have been dead for a while but I can still hear their voices. Mom lives in Alabama right now. She's not with me, but I can hear her voice. My children and grandchildren are in the Northeast, and they're not with me, but I can hear their voice. And you can hear the voice of family and friends that you love. You know their voices. Why? Because you've been with them. And I know, in your case as well as mine, the moment someone you really know, and you answer the phone, that person says, Hi you know exactly who it is. Just that one little split second. Hi. Or however they say it. You know that voice. To get familiar with that voice of Jesus, what do we do? We have to spend time with Jesus. There are no shortcuts. To spend time with Jesus means we have to take time to pray. We have to take time to read the scriptures. We have to take time to worship. We have to take time to be in the presence of Christ and to do what we know Christ wants us to do. There are no shortcuts to exercise. There are no shortcuts to dieting. There are no shortcuts to learning a new musical instrument. There's no shortcut in learning an athletic skill. To know a person, you've got to spend time. To know Jesus, you've got to take time to be holy. Speak off with the Lord. Second thing, it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, test the spirits. You're with Jesus. You know the voice of Jesus. 
But sometimes it's hard to discern. Is it really Jesus speaking over here or is it the devil speaking over here? You know what I mean? And so you have to test the spirits. And, and the way you, I test the spirits, there are a lot of tests, but these are just three tests. The first test I use is, if I'm doing this for Jesus, if I'm saying this to Jesus, would I do it? Would I say it? That's the first test. If Jesus were doing it, if Jesus were saying it, would he do it? Test number two is the great commandment from Matthew chapter 22. To love God with, if I'm doing this, will I be loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and my neighbor and myself, or am I doing this, I'm holding something back? Test number three comes from Galatians 5.22. And that test is the fruit of the Spirit. Will this lead to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? So, spend time with Jesus, test the spirits, but number three, what if you've done that and you still don't know what Jesus wants you to do? That's where you, number three is become part of a group. Sunday school class group, prayer group, a support group, be part of a group. I'm part of three groups. And I've got a group of ministers in which we, we test each other. We hold each other accountable. I'm struggling with this issue. Help me think it through. And they help me to discern the spirits. Now, what if you do all three of those things? You've done it all, and you, you're down to the point you've got to make a decision. Do I marry this person or not? Do I take this job or not? Do I move here or not? Do we make this purchase or not? We, you get to that point, or whatever. What do we do? It's at this point, you do what Martin Luther says, you take that gigantic step of faith. Pick one and go for it, full steam ahead, as if that is exactly what God wants. For if you go full steam ahead and you look back later on you still, and you realize, you know, that's really what God wanted me to do, then you can rejoice that you didn't hesitate. But if you take that step of faith and you look back and you realize, ooh, I made a mistake, don't regret it. Because God would rather us take a gigantic step of faith than be under the paralysis of analysis. That gigantic step of faith instead of being lukewarm and say, well, I just don't know. He says, take that step of faith and you find that as you sin, God would prefer that we sin boldly in the attempt to take a step of faith than do nothing at all. And if it is a sin, if it were a mistake, <laughs> we have the blessing to know that God can take mistakes and turn them into triumphs. Take that step of faith and go. Now, uh, this is Memorial Day weekend. And I can't help but think of some people who have died in the military. One of those I've thought about is Chaplain Emil Capone. He was a POW. And uh, he was tortured just like all the others. But he had an atmosphere that all the other soldiers knew that he was listening to the voice of God. When there was conflict, he'd try to bring peace. When someone died, he took that person's clothes, cleaned it, gave it to other prisoners. When they would argue over who's going to clean the latrine, he would just go do it himself. When people uh, had a path, they had to take water to and from the, the river, and the ground was frozen, he took a piece of bamboo and broke the ice up so they wouldn't have to walk on ice. He gave away his watch to a guard to get a blanket and to tear it up in little strips to be used for socks for the soldiers whose feet were... He just did this. And when they came to get him, to kill him, he had the smile on his face. He said, don't worry. I know the Savior. I know the Savior. And the Savior's going to take care of me. And when I get to heaven, I'll pray for you. Would you like to have a faith like that? Will you close your eyes? Again, look at the image of Jesus. And when you pray, take time to listen to his voice. And one way to listen to the voice is simply, okay, Lord, this is my issue. What do you want me to do? Not my will, Lord, but your will. And almost instantly in your conscience, you know exactly what Jesus wants you to do. You know. More often than not, you know. 
Let Jesus take your hand and say, come on, follow me. I'll help you with it. And if you don't know, spend time with Jesus. Find that group. Lord Jesus, I pray for us. I pray for us here that we hear your voice. We know that you're with us. We know that we tend to walk away. We know we tend to want to do what we want to do and not what's best. So Lord, help us to do what you want done because you will give life. All the others will not. You will give us life, Lord. Help us to be open to your life. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.